What is expansion microscopy? So uh, nanoimaging is very important. The building blocks of life, like genes or biomolecules or gene products, are all nanoscale things. Um, and nanoimaging is uh, a very important field in uh, biology. So super-resolution microscopy, cryoelectric microscopy have um, uh, enabled lots of advances by enabling the imaging of very small um, things, um, you know, such as, you know, proteins and, and so forth. Um, but all these methods uh, face two challenges. One is that they're difficult to apply to large 3D objects, like brains or even brain cells for that matter. And uh, also, they, they uh, tend to be expensive and require a lot of skill. Um, so uh, our thought was um, we often uh, apply sort of um, what I like to call learnable and teachable creativity strategies. And one of my favorite is, can we do the opposite of what everybody's doing? And so, um, you know, for literally 300 years, the way that you image in biology is uh, some kind of lensing effect, right? You magnify some kind of information or energy from an object and then uh, that lensing effect allows the um, the eye or the camera or whatever to, to capture that magnified information. And so we thought, what if we magnified the object instead? Um, so uh, yeah, the first versions of the idea started with uh, brainstorming with um, actually the very first postdoc who joined my group, Brian Chara. We were wondering, could you separate molecules from each other to decrowd them to get better labeling? Um, and so we started thinking about whether you could use things like hydrogels to expand um, objects. Um, and then uh, that was around 2007 or so. Um, several years later, uh, two uh, amazing then graduate students in the group, Faye Chen and Paul Tilburg, were in the group. And um, Faye was trying to do super resolution microscopy, and Paul was exploring electrocroscopy. And um, that's when we really realized how hard nano imaging was. Um, and so we uh, decided to go after expansion, and um, it, uh, we started reading about swallowable polymers and thinking about how to to do the physical magnification, and, and uh, we were able to make it work. So yeah, the first paper in 2015, we could physically magnify brain specimens about 100 times in volume, four and a half times in each direction. And um, yeah, since then, it's been a pretty constant stream of uh, uh, improvements as well as applications. What is the most striking discovery that you have done using this expansion microscopy so far? Uh, that we've done in our group? Yes. Well, uh, our group mostly works on the tool invention, mm -hmm. um, uh, and then others uh, tend to be the people who apply it. Um, but it's been fun to see lots of people solve mysteries within their field. Um, yeah, there, there, there are lots of examples where, um, for example, um, you know, uh, ribosomes, right? They make proteins in, in cells. You know, for decades, they've been studied in dendrites in neurons. Um, Aaron Schumann at the Max Planck uh, in, in Germany showed that um, using expansion, they could find ribosomes on the other side, the presynaptic and axonal side, mm -hmm. um, which was not, uh, as far as I know, visible with electron microscopy. Mm -hmm. um, so that solved, uh, you know, I think that was a mystery for uh, like half a century or something. Um, people are using expansion to um, try to locate where viruses are hiding inside cells or how they move between cells. People are using it to um, make brain maps, you know, so by expanding and labeling the wiring of the brain, could you make a map of the brain, um, so-called kinetomics? Mm -hmm. So recently, um, several teams have uh, showed that they could use expansion to start tracing circuitry of the brain, um, uh, which is very exciting, right? Uh, one of my dreams is if you could make a very detailed map of the brain, you could maybe simulate it in a computer. Mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, one of the things I'd love to be able to do because that would allow us to um, maybe fulfill this question of like, what is a thought or a feeling? Because we could watch it, right, in action. And then in silico, tease apart how, how it emerges from the fundamental building blocks. Um, early cancer detection, we published a paper in 2017. Um, you know, early in a cancer, right, it's hard to do the diagnosis because the changes are small. What if we just make them look bigger? And so early in breast cancer, for example, um, doctors can disagree half the time about the diagnosis by expanding those biopsies, actual biopsies from human patients. Um, we uh, um, had doctors look at those and train a machine learning algorithm to classify them, and it was able to do much better than on the unexpanded um, samples. Um, so yeah, the list goes on and on. Um, I think it's been used in over 700 experimental papers and preprints, mm -hmm. not like review papers, actual experimental uh, papers. So it's spreading very quickly, uh, maybe faster than optogenetics, actually. 
That's incredible. And the funny thing is that you develop a technology and you don't know what is the, what will be exactly the outcome. There are so many surprises, you know, the cancer, the, the diagnostics, etc. And it's incredible to see that your work is actually used by thousands, as you mentioned, around the globe to solve not only fundamental problems in biology, but also in, in translational science and diagnostics and etc. And this is, I think, only the beginning, right? Um, can we... I'd like to pick up your brain on the connectomics, but I will come back on that and ask you about um, the technique itself. So when you say expansion, <coughs> we know that in the brain, uh, the cells are very crowded. You have neurons, you have glia, and you have also blood vessels, and everything is very, very tight together. And by expanding it, you basically make things that are invisible to our eye, visible, so to say. But how do you preserve the tissue from rupturing, for example? And how do you know that, okay, when this was actually intact in the brain, and now it's expanded, it's exactly more or less the same proportion? So we expand cells or tissues, we are rupturing them. We're disrupting everything, actually, right? We're moving molecules apart from each other. Um, you know, cell membranes have been expanded and therefore they're no longer continuous membranes. Um, so yeah, it is being disrupted from like a life function standpoint, but the information is not being disrupted. The relative organization is being preserved. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that's partly by design. We designed the expansion procedure to be as even as possible. So there's four key steps, anchoring, polymerization, softening, and expansion. So the first step is we apply anchors to everything. Those are like little handles. The second step is we form the polymer, which binds those handles. We then could add water, and this is swellable polymer, basically the stuff in baby diapers. So absorb the water, and if it swells and then applies force to the handles, we'd pull the molecules apart. But before we do that, there's a, so a softening step. So we can use enzymes or detergent or heat um, to soften everything up, and that helps us move them apart. Mm -hmm. So. By design, the process is intended to be as even as possible, mm -hmm. uh, but also through lots of validation, right? We can compare uh, to known ground truth, right? Electron microscopy, super resolution microscopy, and um, you know now we're almost ten years into this um, uh, since the first paper we published on it, and uh, you know people have validated it in uh, almost every imaginable system, you know, worms and flies, human tissues. Um, you know, uh, preprints out there, expanding bone, you know, um, uh, from a uh, G.B. Chang, a professor at KAIST who used to be a postdoc in our group, um, you, know, uh, you know, the work that, uh, yeah, in, in Sylvia Rosoli's group about expanding protein fragments apart from each other, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, um, and so far expansion seems to hold up uh, very, very well. And the more it's tested, um, uh, the more it seems that it's even better than we thought originally. Mm -hmm. um, but also expansion can be modified, right? So there's two design criteria for a great tool as far as our group's concerned. So first of all, it should be very easy to use, right? Ease of use is important, right? You know, CRISPR wasn't the first genome editor. You know, um, PCR wasn't the first way of copying DNA. Um, you know, uh, next-gen sequencing, even by the name, was not the first method of sequencing <laughs> DNA. Um, but ease of use matters, and in all three of those cases, you know, those are much easier to do than their precursors, right? Uh, green fluorescent protein was much easier to use than earlier um, fluorescent proteins that required small molecule chemicals to be added, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So yeah, expansion, we want it to be very easy to use, and so anybody could adopt it um, or adapt it if they need to. Um, and uh, yeah, also inexpensive. So ideally, a technology would not require hardware that people don't ordinarily have. And again, if you look at a lot of the really great inventions like green fluorescent protein or PCR or you know next-gen sequencing and so forth, um, you know, the, well, except for next gen sequencing, I guess, where there are, you know, a sequencer does make the process a lot easier, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, but even there, right, the, the goal is to bring the cost down.